Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's Worth Electronic webinar. And of course, partnered with our dear friends over at DigiKey Electronics. It might look a little different right now. Uh, that is because for us in the United States, we are celebrating the Thanksgiving holiday, and a lot of us are working uh, elsewhere preparing for the big holiday. And if you have forgotten, take the turkey out of the freezer. So that is your reminder here. I'm Amelia Thompson, your host for today's Worth Electronic webinar. And today's webinar is DC link capacitors, specifications, and applications. And it's being presented by Worth Electronics' very own Jan Isku Rodriguez. He's a hardware engineer for the capacitors and the resistors division at Worth Electronic. And it's so great to have him back presenting one of our final webinars of 2022. Now, if you have any questions, uh, don't forget to ask them in the questions box and Jan will hopefully get around to answering them at the end. But if we don't get your question answered, maybe we need to go into detail a little bit more, or maybe you think of a question later, then you can always still ask the question and we will answer them offline. Simply look for the email at here or uh, webinar team at we online.com. Because you registered for today's webinar, you're automatically going to receive the webinar on demand, that video replay and the presented slides within the following week. Again, we do have a major US holiday on Thursday and our US offices are closed on Friday as well. So we will get that to you. Don't forget to register for our final webinar of 2022. It's coming up next Tuesday. It's EMC filters from component to design. And you can register online at www.we-online.com slash webinar. Now I'm going to hand it over. Let's begin today's Worth Electronic Webinar with Jan Isku Rodriguez as he presents DC link capacitors, specifications, and applications partnered with DigiKey Electronics. Uh, okay. So thanks, Amelia. Um, and also welcome from my side. Um, yeah, as Amelia said, I, my name is Yonizco Rodriguez and um, I have been working in the capacitor division uh, in Morte Electronics for more than four years now. Um, I take care of some technical aspects uh, regarding the application and the use capacitors and also resistors, uh, as, well as, as well as measurements and other things like simulation models and Red Expert. So let's get started. Uh, in this webinar, uh, we want to talk about DC Link, um, obviously. So we will explain what DC Link even means and present our uh, new products from this application. Uh, then I will speak about some details in the specification that I think are important for developers and also I will show you some measurements uh, for better understanding of the components as well as simulation and other interesting things. Uh, finally, uh, we will see some application examples in circuits and other applications and we will talk about the design process in comparison with uh, aluminum electrolytic capacitors. So, um, yeah, T-ceiling capacitors are also traditionally called like this because um, they are placed between different power stages and the DC interconnection requires some, some capacitance. So in English, uh, this capacitor placement uh, also, it's also called DC bus, DC bus capacitor. Um, so this capacitance is required to stabilize the DC voltage, as well as providing some energy buffering um, for the power stage. Let's uh, let's look at this example of an inverter um, powered by three-phase um, AC mains voltage. So in the middle, uh, between the rectifier and the inverter, you can see the DC bus. Um, DC link capacitor, and this is the placement of DC link. Uh, any DC, DC capacitor can be a DC link capacitor, but when we talk about DC link, we are we are thinking about high voltage, high power circuits. So here uh, we can use the uh, the high voltage, high current film capacitors that are specifically designed for such application. Uh, very often, these these film capacitor series are called DC link 
capacitors. Uh, we could also use more classic uh, general purpose aluminum, uh, aluminum electrolytic capacitors. In the case of very low voltage, we could also use polymer capacitors or polymer hybrid capacitors, but in this presentation we are, we are going to focus on the high voltage, high power application. Uh, finally, we could also be using um, ceramic chip capacitors. Um, class 1 ceramics are, are required, um, in this case, for the, due to the high current and low ESR requirements. So these high voltage capacitors are only possible with very low capacitance, so in the nanofarad uh, range. Uh, but of course, they are used in very specific DC applications uh, that use very high frequency, high high switching frequency uh, and high voltage. So yeah, the circuits that use film or electrolytic capacitors are more or less similar and sometimes even uh, the, the capacitors can be interchangeable, but the circuits that use TC-Link MSCs are very different, so um, we're not going to focus that much on MSCs. So TC-Link capacitors are necessary for many power conversion applications. Uh, that have any kind of DC stage. For example, um, you have a DC input and, at the solar inverter or a DC output at um, EV chargers or other battery chargers. Sometimes the DC link is on the middle stage, like the AC to motor drive that I, I showed you before. All these applications are relevant today in the larger group of technologies here where we all grow renewable energies and electric mobility in general. Um, also including parts inside the vehicles or outside, like charging poles. Now, um, as I said before, um, we want to use this opportunity to talk about our uh, new DC Link products. We are very happy to introduce this year uh, the new PCAP FTDB series film capacitor. Uh, specifically designed for DC-Link. So you can find them already since one week, I think, uh, already in our online catalog and also in Red Expert, if you are familiar with it. Um, we are releasing 24 parts, standard catalog parts, uh, which are always available from our central warehouse. Uh, we have rated voltage from 500 to 1200 volts and also capacitance between 1 and 75 microfarad. Um, yeah, other values on sites are available upon request, but, but yeah, please contact us if you need something that is not uh, exactly how you want it. Uh, the MKP uh, means metallized polypropylene film, uh, which means that we are using a polypropylene uh, thin plastic film as dielectric and a thin layer of aluminium that is uh, metallized on one side and that's uh, acting as the electrode. So two films like these are rolled together and they create this kind of capacitors. Um, polypropylene materials provide very stable capacitance uh, characteristic as well as long life and self-healing properties. Um, we'll talk about that later. So uh, now let's talk about the favorite part of engineer work, which is the data sheet. I'm joking, of course, but yeah. Uh, we have to talk about some aspects that uh, should be important for designers. And also, I will show you other stuff, uh, but it's not in the data sheet. So this is the this is one example data sheet of a 75 microfarad capacitor with rated voltage of 900 volt. So this capacitor is quite big. As you can see in the drawings, it, it actually has four pins uh, instead of two. Uh, so increased current capability and increased mechanical robustness because it's, it's quite quite beefy. It's, uh, I don't know if you can see the camera. I don't know. I don't. I don't see myself now. So now, uh, for most of you, uh, most of you will mainly look at the at the table in the in the in the top corner. All right. So this is the table. Um, let's take a couple of minutes here because uh, there is a lot of information to, to check. So um, first, I strongly, I strongly recommend that you always pay attention to the test conditions. 
So check if the applied conditions of frequency, voltage, uh, temperature, and others will apply to your application or not. Um, you may be making assumptions to use this information that may not be correct. Um, polypropylene film capacitors in general are very stable. So generally speaking, the specification will be correct. And I will show you this in the following slides. Um, but this is not happening always. So especially with other capacitor technologies with ceramic and electrolytic, um, you have to be careful. We made a, a full webinar on this topic uh, some months ago, so you can check it in, in YouTube, in our YouTube channel. Um, so another interesting thing is that we, we specify this part as rated for 900 volt, but uh, this rating is only valid for up to 85 degree Celsius. So the component is um, it's also rated for 105 degree. So there is a rating voltage, a rating of voltage after 85 degrees. So I will go into the into detail later, um, but you have to take this into account for high temperature. Um, another interesting thing: the dissipation factor is defined as as the as a ratio of real and imaginary part of complex impedance, or if you prefer the polar representation, like the picture. Um, this is the tangents of the angle delta between between impedance and resistance. So sometimes dissipation factor also called tangents delta because of the reason. Since the frequency is part of the reactance formula, uh, the dissipation factor will increase proportionately with frequency. So let's look at this measurement now. I performed this measurement myself uh, in our small lab in Berlin. So I used the impedance analyzer in, in the picture and yeah, you can see this capacitor is quite big. So ESR and dissipation factor are similar parameters, but yeah, because of the frequency dependency, um, it is easier to understand the diagram in the left side. But yeah, this is my opinion. Now, I, I marked the specification values from the data sheet in the graphs. The ESR in the left, uh, we are a bit lower, but almost correct for this for the typical value of 4.7 milliohm at 10 kilohertz. The dissipation factor is specified as a maxi as maximum values, so we are significantly lower at around 0.2 percent at um, 1 kilohertz and 2 percent 2 percent at 10 kilohertz, and the maximum being 3 percent. So fine. So you will not find this kind of frequency graphs uh, in the data sheet, but uh, this is available in our um, free online tool, Red Expert. So uh, I will explain later a little bit more about this if you are not familiar. And let's move on uh, with the data sheet. Uh, we can find more information in the table called the general information. So this is the temperature range, but of course, as we saw before, some specification will change uh, at a high temperature. And this is my measurement of the temperature characteristic from average of several, this is average of several um, FTTV capacitors. So the red line will show you the capacitance change. As you can see, the value is very, very stable uh, with a change between one and minus 3% um, along the temperature range. In the gray line, you can see the ESR change, but um, yeah, there is some change in ESR, uh, especially at lower temperature, but taking into account the very low ESR, um, this 10% variation should, should not be a problem. Um, so let's go back and look at the ripple current specification of the same capacitor. Again, we have to be very aware of the test conditions. Um, 10 kilohertz makes sense as a reference of a working frequency, but also now we have a 70 degree operation temperature. So what does this even mean? Um, we also wrote here in the data sheet that we define a standard electric properties at 20 degree, unless specified differently. But in operation, there is a ripple current, and, and due to the ESR, the ripple current will create self-heating. 
So to guarantee reliability and long life, uh, we have this self-heating maximum specification of uh, 15 degrees. So you can see here. So in short, at 70 degrees, and with the maximum river current specified of 35.7 amps, RMS, um, we expect a self-heating of 15 degrees. And with this, we arrive at the 85 degrees Celsius, where the rest of the parameters are still valid. So as we said before, for temperatures higher than 85 degrees, um, some specifications must be taken uh, with care or because of change. So for more information, we, we add this uh, temperature directing diagrams for, in the data sheet. Um, as you can see in the left, the voltage rating apply up to 85 degrees Celsius. This is the maximum rated voltage. In the right, you can see that the current rating applies up to 70 degrees, like in the specification. And from this point on, the self-heating will be taken into account um, and uh, the rating must, is necessary. So something else in the data sheet, um, also related. Uh, so in the third page, uh, you find this diagram. So in, we include this to visualize the, the relationship between operating DC voltage, operating temperature, and the component lifetime as a result of those conditions. So as we said before, the maximum rated voltage must be reduced to 70% if the operation temperature is as high as the highest permitted temperature of 105 degree. Inversely, um, if we operate at a comfortable 70 degrees or less, a higher DC voltage is actually permitted and the lifetime will also be increased. So in any case, uh, we will expect a longer life if we either operate at reduced voltage or temperature, as you can see in this area. So you may be able to get some maneuvering room uh, choosing a capacitor with a higher voltage rating as needed. Um, but of course, the size of the capacitor for a high voltage will be, will be larger. So uh, finally, what does lifetime even means? Um, so our end of life definition is similar to, to other capacitors. Um, so we expect after an estimated lifetime that the capacitance uh, will drop uh, a maximum of, of 5%. So there is, but there is no point in time when the capacitor will completely stop working. So the degradation will, will mean a capacitance drop, uh, ESR um, increase and a very, very small leakage current increase. So another interesting thing in the page number six of the data sheet, um, I recommend always that you check all the pages and read all the pages of the data sheet. And there are lots of useful information and important, important warnings um, written in a small print. So in this case, I want to show you this point in the section called operation, operation load conditions. So here we are trying to say that there is a limit to the voltage ripple at the capacitor and it should be never be greater than the 0 0.3 times the rate of voltage. So the repetitive uh, peak voltage value should never be larger than, than the rated voltage. This is also another, another rule that may be overseen. So you can see a diagram for clarification um, of one um, let's say, a uh, uh, illegal use of the capacitor. So this is what we call the DC max DC voltage uh, in, other, in other documents. Um, here you can see the full impedance spectrum uh, also from the impedance analyzer. The graph uh, shows the impedance of over frequency of measurements of three components of the FTDB family, all rated for 900 volt and different capacitance. The red curve is one microfarad, the blue curve is 10 microfarad, and the yellow one is 75 microfarad. So the, the biggest capacitor that we have in the portfolio. Of course, uh, we can see that at lower frequencies, the impedance will drop with the increased capacitance, of course, as expected. Um, 
something also interesting in this graph is that um, about um, both the one microfarad and ten microfarad capacitors have a have a pin distance pin distance of or pin space of 25 uh, 27.5 millimeter. So uh, and therefore the inductive section of the impedance um, at higher frequencies is the same. So this conf this confirms more or less the rule of thumb of approximately calculating 0 0.5 nanohenries per millimeter between the pins. But uh, I don't like rules of thumb, so I'm not even writing this in the slides. But yeah, you can see this uh, this conclusion here. You can also expect uh, that bigger size components have a lower ESR, um, and also normally higher capacitance and lower ESR. So you can see this in the yellow curve. So the last thing before we start with the applications. Um, this is the general um, simple application, simple equivalent circuit model of a capacitor. So, um, if we use the impedance spectrum that we saw before, uh, we can determine um, it the values of its non-ideal component and, and get the curve of the of, of the equivalent circuit to be similar to the measurement. So this is what we get. Um, this is, this is what we get with the parameters that you can see in this slide. As you can see, this simple model provides an almost ideal characterization of the frequency, um, uh, the frequency characteristics, of course, of a real capacitor. So we will include this, these parameters in our SPICE libraries uh, that you can download from our website. Or if you want to create your own models, uh, we provide this information in Red Expert. Um, or if you need some uh, help uh, regarding simulation, uh, please. Uh, Jan, can I cut you? That it looks like we yes. did cut out some audio. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. All right. Um, shall I go on? Yes, go on. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. So yeah, let's uh, let's talk about some circuits, some applications. Um, um, I want to show you some some simplified circuit schematics of where you can use the CC link film capacitors. For example, um, here we have a rectifier with an inverter. Um, or available frequency motor. Uh, we already saw this circuit before. Um, this could be also a motor drive coming from a DC source, like a battery, maybe in an electric vehicle. This is a representation of a solar inverter, maybe. <laughs> Imagine, or let's pretend that these uh, switches are IGBTs, for example, and this could be a solar inverter. Um, this uh, Looks like a rectifier, synchronous rectifier, maybe, uh, but maybe the left switch. Um, we can have also a totem pole PFC topology if the if the left switches are switching on, on another different um, frequency, maybe. Or, for example, um, this is more or less a regular synchronous DC DC converter that may be used in countless applications. So in all of these cases, um, here we have the capacitors that are absolutely absolutely necessary for these applications. So depending on voltage and power, our FTDP series could be excellent options here. Um, there can even more there can be even more applications for this kind of um, components. Uh, I have a great example. I can show you uh, this application is built by designers from OnSemi. So it, it is a three-phase bidirectional um, charger for electrical vehicles with a rated voltage of 35 kilowatt. So all the project is built around the switches that they are using, which are uh, silicon carbide integrated modules. Of course, um, on semi all are using many of their technologies in this 
in this application, like gate drivers, uh, power sources, and also communication interface. Um, this system is made by two separate standalone boards. In the left, we have the ACDC, uh, three-phase rectifier uh, PFC with uh, with diesel capacitors, and in the right uh, we have a, a bidirectional DC DC converter, uh, which is which have two symmetrical power stages and also providing isolation from galvanic isolation from input and output. So in this project we were working very closely with OnSemi and we provide them with the FTDV series capacitors. Uh, that were fulfilling their exact requirements. So I mark here the position where the designers from OnSemi placed, uh, placed our FTDV capacitors. Uh, in this case, I think 75 microfarad parts with a rated voltage of 900 volt. So the same capacitors that we saw before. Um, yeah, here uh, are some pictures for, for you. Uh, of the boards that I was talking about. So the, uh, in the left, the PFC module and ACDC converter. So the black capacitors are placed close to the silicon carbide switches that are not visible because they are under the heat sinks. Um, of course, we also provided the phase input inductors uh, from Volta Electronic, of course. In the right, um, the bidirectional DC DC converter, and you can clearly see two identical power stages uh, with the DC link capacitors on the side. So in the middle, you can find the power inductor and the transformer for the DC DC converter. If you are interested in this topic, um, I can provide you some documentation. On, but yeah, there is a, a series of documents on blog posts about the development of of this board, which are very interesting and. The, there is a website called How to Power, and you can find this also in the homepage of OnSemi. Uh, of course, as I said, DC capacitors are really normal DC capacitors, so we can use them in any kind of DC converter or switch mode power supply. In this example, my colleagues uh, from Magnetics have uh, built a high voltage bidirectional back push converter as a demonstration for different technologies of world electronic. So in this case, the focus was uh, the, to test the new auxiliary gate drive transformer, um, which you can see now, um, which is specific, specifically designed for silicon carbide and gallium nitride uh, switches. So this is behind the, the heat sink, so that's why you cannot see it. And also, uh, this is the reference design that we suggest in our documentation. You can find it in our homepage, and yeah, it's called RD001. So yeah, this is a test bench, but also uh, this is a, a, a very, um, yeah, reasonable circuit. So as I said before, uh, Boost capacitors may be of different technologies, and sometimes DC link film capacitors may be used in similar application as the aluminum electrolytic capacitors. So let's see a comparison. Let's do a comparison now, and let's see. So uh, now I'm repeating, uh, just to repeat, uh, the film capacitors, with what we have is a very stable capacitor with high current cap capability and also long life. Uh, due to the advantage of the metallized polypropylene materials, um, we can provide this long life. Uh, also, we have high rated voltage and we have 1.2 kilovolt in our portfolio. Uh, the limits of MKP may be around 1.6 kilovolt. So in comparison, um, electrolytic capacitors can provide much more capacitance in the same space for a lower cost also. But because ESR is so high um, in comparison to film caps, um, the maximum ripple current will be limited, even for the very big parts. So the maximum rated voltage uh, are, are also much lower. So up to 650 volt, um, and this is limitation of the, of the technology. 
So to get them to work at high voltage, a series connection of capacitors is possible, but um, cell balancing may be necessary and the complexity will increase. Um, finally, um, yeah, due to the, electric, the liquid uh, component, the electric, liquid electrolyte, uh, the lifetime of electrolytic capacitors uh, may be much shorter. Um, it depends a lot of the operation conditions, so especially temperature. <clears throat> uh, now, as we know, these healing capacitors are very di diverse and the specification requirements are very different. So we cannot even try to give you a general design process. But um, yeah, the requirements look like this more or less. Um, voltage, power, switching frequency, and then some other specification like inductance, if you have some some motors of electric motors or maybe DC converters. Maybe voltage ripple is very important for inverters or yeah, maybe ripple current or capacitance sometimes is already calculated and required for some for some um or let's say another power stage. So the current requirement should be calculated. And also, we recommend that simulations are needed to get reasonable expectation about the, the amount of, of um, ripple current flowing in and out of the capacitor. So the shape of the current will, will also not be sinusoidal or triangular. So it's very it's necessary to have simulation that will also calculate the, the total EMS EMS value. Um, as well as the peak values and harmonics. So if we are using field capacitors, um, we will get high rated current per part, but also not that much capacitance, which may be enough depending uh, depending on the voltage ripple requirement. For the same rated current, um, I will need more more parts and more capacitance than needed if we if we want to use elect electrolytic capacitors so the result of of of, of using tc uh, film capacitors is the is that thanks to the low esr we have less self heating and also a long life as i said before with um with aluminum elcos we'll probably have a very high capacitance and the good thing now is that the ripple voltage will be very small and the bad thing is that now we have to be careful with the charging and discharging because of course the total energy stored will be much larger so depending on the application a lot of energy must be dissipated um, maybe to safely discharge the capacitors after switching off the system for example uh, please notice uh, that i didn't not i didn't mention the cost for now um, there is a intuition uh, that is misleading because the uh, uh, electrolytic capacitors will be much cheaper for more capacitance. But in the end, it's possible that we also need much less capacitance um, if we are not using electrolytic capacitors. So, um, yeah, let's see that with a with a with an example. Now let's pretend we have a motor application like in this diagram. And to, to simplify the calculations, I use some one-phase formulas, so one-phase motor. If I have an 800 volt DC bus and an inverter switching one phase of the motor uh, of 100 megahenry winding and 25 kilohertz, so nothing really special. So the result I got is that I require about 28 amperes of ERMS ripple current. For a reference, this calculation, um, I will need about 50 microfarad of DC link capacitance uh, to get to get around 8 per 8 volt, so 10% of um, sorry, 1% of peak-to-peak -peak ripple voltage. So yeah, these calculations are. Let's assume these calculations are correct for one phase of the motor, and let's move on. So one way to do this will be uh, using two parallel film capacitors. Um, 
of the FTTP service. So this specific part number is rated at uh, 900 volt DC and also 50 microfarads. So we wait more than needed capacitance. Also we need to because the maximum ERMS current of this capacitor is only 17.9 amperes. So we have a total of 35.8 um, ampere RMS capability. With this solution, I calculated the, that I have uh, about 4 volt peak, peak to peak, uh, river voltage, and we are safe and in the in the operating range, and we can expect more than 100,000 hours of lifetime, as long as we operate below 80 degrees. So um, let's see. If we want to use electrolytic capacitors, we have to place many of them. <laughs> So first, we are using 450 volt parts because uh, we only have capacitors up to 550 or 600 volt. And we need two of them in series uh, to get the 900 volt rating. Also, um, yeah, this, uh, also this is also big capacitors uh, and still, we are only getting a rating of 5.7 amps RMS. So we need five of them in parallel. Uh, in total, we will have 10 cells for a total capacitance of 1.4 millifarad. So at around uh, 60 degree, for example, uh, we will have enough current rating it, uh, in total. So the current rating will be maybe a bit, a bit lower uh, at higher temperature, but if we think 55 degree, this is this is okay. Of course, uh, now we have way more capacitance that we needed. <laughs> so the ripple voltage is very small; it's 0 0.3 volt. Now I calculated uh, with these conditions. The, I calculated the lifetime, and I got around um, 30,000 30, hours at 55 degree, which is which is okay. This is some some four years, uh, about four years of, of life, low life. So these calculations, um, yeah, this is just an example, um, but they may be optimized with other requirements for the application. But um, this example serves to demonstrate that film caps have less capacitance for more cost in space, but they can also get the job done um, with less parts. So in this example, the thin cap solution will cost about three times less than the total um, electrolytic caps bank. E even if we did not have the double voltage requirement and we were only using five electrolytic cells, we will still be more expensive than having two DC link thin caps. And we still have a more reliable uh, solution due to the um, polypropylene film technology. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, so before I finish, um, one last suggestion, and maybe I, meant, uh, I mentioned Red Expert before, but maybe yeah, you are not familiar with this. Uh, this is our online component selection tool. So you can find it in our website, or also you can find links in our online catalog, and it's completely free to use. We have shown some graphs that uh, have the Red Expert log on them, and that means that you can find these graphs in, in Red Expert. Um, so in the left, you can see some useful design tools uh, like Filter Designer or this is Converter Designer. And in the right, you can find also some product modules more focused in the components. So you can use it for free. And as I said, uh, we don't have to, you don't have to create an account, but some functionality will only be enabled after you register. Uh, another big advantage, if you if you if you have an account, is that um, you can select some components and add them to the shopping basket, and then you can order free samples with a couple of clicks. So this is the new TC Link module, and you can see some of the curves I already showed you before in the presentation. So this is very easy to use. Um, and this is the, the best to find the most suitable component for your application. 
So use this header um, to filter for specific values and sort the, the results. In this case, I have filtered the table to show me a DC link capacitor uh, with capacitance between 10 and 30 microfarad and a rated voltage of at least 600 volt. Um, so if I, if I click here in this PDF symbol, um, I can get the data sheet and have more information about each part. Here, I can select three parts, and from these three components, I will get the curves in the bottom with the, with the market color for each component. Um, here in the, in the ESR curve, I can pull the slider and, and move the slider to, for example, 25 kilohertz, uh, because this is what our example application frequency. Um, then I will get in the, uh, a new column showing me the ESR measurements at that, at that frequency. So I can sort the table also and find the one that uh, maybe has the lowest ESR. I can also press add button and the components that are in the in the tray will be added add to the shopping to the shopping cart. Uh, in the top, I can find the shopping cart and I am I, I am able to order free samples uh, as easy as this. So uh, before we finish, just a small summary of the presentation. Um, so this this table capacitors connected to the DC bus in some power converter topologies are called DC link capacitors and they are necessary to stabilize the DC voltage and provide a low impedance pass for the current that are necessary in the power stages of the converter. So I showed you some interesting details inside of the specification and I also showed you some interesting measurements uh, to better understand these components. I also show you some simulation uh, parameters. Uh, later, I talk about some, some application examples and I also explore um, some example calculation for the comparison with aluminum electrolytic capacitors. There is a lot to this topic, but uh, there is no time to, to, to discuss this. Um, to finish, I introduce the Red Expert platform as a tool for designers. So I hope you liked the presentation and I hope you you learned something with me today. And yeah, thanks again uh, uh, for making it to the end of the presentation. And uh, now I think we will go with the questions and we'll try to answer the questions that you submit during the presentation. Um, yes, thank you for presenting yeah. today's electronic webinar. We do have a few questions rolling on in. Um, our first question here, are these film capacitors qualified for automotive use, AECQ? Uh, no, for now, uh, unfortunately, we don't have the AECQ um, certification. Of course, our our own qualification process is similar um, and also is thorough um, before we release the products. Uh, but no, for now, we are not doing this qualification. Okay, thank you. Our next question here, does the film current rating change much with frequency? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, Yes, no. Um, the thing is, um, as you saw in the curve, in the impedance curve, you are supposed to use the capacitors up to the self-resonance frequency, so the minimum in the impedance curve. And um, up to this frequency, it's fine to use the to the, the specification is fine. Um, but of course, um, you have to look at the ESR curve and be sure that the, that you are not generating a lot of a lot of uh, heat, self-heating in the component. So again, 
if, if you are very far away from the 10 kilohertz specify, specification uh, for current, I, I can only recommend that you do a lot of simulation and, and you do a lot of um, testing and um, to check that you don't surpass this 15 degree uh, self-heating um, limit because then if you surpass this, yeah, the, the lifetime will be, will be much lower. Okay, thank you. And uh, going on into the lifetime here, uh, they understand why an electrolytic capacitor will wear out over time and temperature, but why will a film capacitor wear out? Um, so there is a process. Um, there was something written in the in the slide, but maybe I didn't uh, mention this enough. Um, so the um, um, uh, let's see the the, the film um, material, which is this polypropylene dielectricum, with the heat and the humidity content, uh, it will degrade and it will create in combination with the voltage, it will create some um, erasure or some removal of the metallization. So we are losing surface. Let's see, uh, we are losing surface of the electrodes if you can imagine this, and then this is why the, the capacitance will drop with time. And yeah, this is how it degrades uh, with, yeah, with time. Excellent, thank you. We do have time for a few more questions here, and then we are going to wrap up today's Worth Electronic webinar. Our next question, what type, and you might have gone over this, this question did come in at the beginning, what type of of capacitors are these DC link capacitors, X or Y? Uh, this is no, no, no. <laughs> this is no capacitor rated for um, for AC voltage. So X or Y capacitors are only these are only specified for mains voltage or yeah. Uh, AC voltage. So you are not supposed to use these DC link capacitors for um, for this application because this is uh, these are rated for DC voltage. Excellent. And like I said, I do believe that you did cover um, that, but maybe not the definition towards the beginning of your presentation. Our yeah. next question. What is the physical reason for the reduction in DC link voltage versus temperature? Yeah, um, as I said before, um, this is, has a lot to do with the reliability and the, the guarantee in a, a long life. So, um, yeah, because the voltage in combination with temperature will uh, will reduce the lifetime. So, um, as I said, to have a, an acceptable lifetime, you need, um, yeah, you need to have either too much a lot of voltage or a lot of current, uh, sorry, a lot of voltage or a lot of temperature, but both, um, um, yeah, are not um, in a safe application. Thank you. A couple more questions here, and then we are going to wrap up. Uh, for AC input applications, do you think that DC link film capacitors is a better solution? Um, it depends, um, like always. Um, de it depends a lot. Uh, as I, uh, I show you, for example, um, one case where the where there was a PFC uh, with a totem pole topology. Uh, so this could be interesting if you are doing some very exact or very very um, restrictive PFC. Um, this could be interesting. Of course, in many in many cases of AC filtering um, uh, rectifier, AC rectifier from mains, um, I can imagine in most of the cases it's more important that you have a lot of capacitance, and then it's probably it's a better so, uh, option that you get um, electrolytic capacitors. But I can imagine in some cases, if you have directly, just directly, you have a, another power stage using high frequency switching. I can imagine that, for example, in this case, uh, a DC link capacitor, film capacitor will be um, more 
more optimized, more efficient, and also maybe uh, cheaper. Excellent. And our final question for today might require you to go back a few slides. It's on slide 22. How did you yeah. calculate the value? Let me see. I don't, I don't remember exactly the 22. Uh, which, which value? Because there are many calculations here. Um, does not specify. Okay. Um, you write maybe you write uh, more specific the question, and I will write you uh, answer to you this in the in another email because I can show you the the formulas I, I were I was using for this. Absolutely, and we do have some really great formulas on there. I was having some technical difficulties on my end. I assume a few other people were as well. But if you do have these questions, simply ask them in the questions box, and we will reply to them offline. Uh, again, if you do have any questions, simply reply to our follow-up email because you registered. You are automatically going to get an email with this video presentation and an attachment with the presented slides that will come in from webinar team at we-online.com. We are going to go ahead and wrap things up for today. Jan, thank you so much for presenting our second to last webinar of 2022 uh, and don't forget everybody you can register for next week's webinar it is the last one it's emc filters from component to design register online at www.we-online.com webinars and of course you can listen to our webinars on the worth electronic what's up podcast where we are creating uh, both MP4 and MP3 format, the video and audio formats for our podcast. You can find them on Spotify, YouTube, uh, Google Podcasts, any major podcast streaming network. That is the Worth Electronic What's Up podcast, where we launch a new podcast every Thursday, with the exception of this Thursday, because it is Thanksgiving. So everybody here in the United States, have a very happy and safe Thanksgiving. And thank you all for joining us for today's webinar. I'm Amelia Thompson. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thanks, Amelia. Bye.